introduce Jonathan Corbay standing right there. I've actually got some notes this morning because he's so impressive I don't want to get any of this wrong. If anyone's reading the bio, put your hand up every time I stuff it up. Jo he is a Kernel contributor, co-founder of LWN Net, the lead author of Linux Device Drivers, the third edition. And if I can read my own writing, he's <laughs> the Kernel Summit on the Kernel Summit Program Committee for some years apparently, and on the Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board. So if you would, please give a very loud Australian welcome <laughs> to Jonathan Corbet. Thank you. All right, well, well, thank you all very much. Um, what a nice welcome. People who have seen me give talks before know that I tend to talk a whole lot about how well the kernel development process works. And in fact, it does work well. We're doing four or five releases a year, every 80 days, pretty much like clockwork anymore. Every one of these releases incorporates um, something like 10,000 changes coming from over 1,000 developers. This, all this work shows up in everything from uh, very large systems to your phone and your toaster and next year your toothbrush perhaps, the whole thing actually works pretty well. And that's what I tend to talk about, but I'm not here to talk about that kind of stuff today. That's boring, I'm tired about that. It's time to talk instead about when things don't work quite as well as, they, as one might like, when things go wrong. And so one might ask, well, why is it that you want to do that? And there's a whole lot of reasons for looking at failures, and analyzing them, trying to figure out what went on. Starting with, um, the, the problems we've had at times with high profile failures giving the kernel process a bad name. People coming away saying you can't work with these people, things go wrong, it's not a friendly development process, that sort of thing. Um, you see stuff that shows up in the media sometimes. Um, so we had this terrible thing that a key contributor has um, admitted, admitted that the process can be intimidating and hard to break into. Um, it came from a reputable source, um, <laughs> although it was actually pointing somewhere else. The actual source actually came from LCA um, a little while back. So learn, maybe it's time to start saying some other things for a while. Got to be careful. But more to the point, what I'm really after here is that you learn from failure. Right, um, you can learn from when things go wrong. This is another quote from another highly influential figure in, in our community. This is not from me. Um, this comes from someone else who says that, um, that yes, it's great to celebrate success, but it's um, better to heed the lessons of failure. So that's what I'm here for. And the quote that really motivated this is something I read many years ago in grad school from a book um, called the, the Science of the Artificial by Herbert Simon. Um, he was a Nobel Prize winner in economics, did various things like that. Very good book if you're interested in this. This was a book really about artificial intelligence and the study of the functioning of the brain. But he says that a road or a bridge under normal conditions just serves as a flat surface that you can drive vehicles over. It's only when it's overloaded that you learn something about how it is built. In general, a working system is a black box. It's just something that does what it's supposed to do. It's boring. As soon as it fails, you learn something about what's going on inside. So that's um, my purpose here, is to look a bit at what's going on inside. Um, one note that I want to, um, to put up first, there, there are a lot of um, interesting figures in the <laughs> kernel development um, community, right? Um, but I'm not really here to talk about them at all. This isn't, I'm not here to poke fun at the stranger folks who tend to hang out on the edges of, of our mailing list and so on. Um, I'm going to be naming names because I'm going to be looking at th where things went wrong and I don't see any way to do it without naming names. But every developer that I talk about here is someone that I really respect, somebody who's contributed to our community, someone who I hope will continue to, often they won't be, but I wish they were. Um, I'm not here to shame anybody because um, we all make mistakes. The point is to simply say that yes, I made a mistake. Um, I found another way to not um, solve your problem and we'll go on from there. So if we're ready, we'll hit the road and start looking at, um, at where things go wrong. So example number one. Back um, a few years ago, I mean, a couple of them had to do with file systems and the, the effort to get a new next generation file system. A guy named Daniel Phillips, who has um, shown up at this conference in the past, although I haven't seen him for a few years, came out and said, OK, I'm going to create this file system called Tux3. Because after all, Tux2 was going to be the great file system that took over the world, but then it didn't. For, for various reasons, but Tux3 was going to do it. It had a lot of very interesting architectural ideas built into it. 
He came out in, um, in July of 2008, posted the, the initial version of the file system. There were a lot of interesting discussions, discussions with um, Matt Dillon of Dragonfly BSD, who did the Hammer file system about how you might design file systems. It looked like it was going somewhere. A few months later, he had it um, working well enough to, to boot a Linux system as the root file system. And then things kind of went um, quiet and so on and slowed down. And if you look in their repository, which is still out there, you'll see that in 2009, a year and a half ago, was the final commit. And even the last commits for a while have been sort of trickling off into fairly desultory sort of little cleanup things. And the project is dead. Tux3 is not in, in the mainline kernel. I don't think it ever will be at this point. So what happened? As this process was going along, and sometime after he was saying this, it boots as, as root and so on, Andrew Morton came to him and, and said very clearly, do not fall into the trap of continuing to add stuff to an out-of-tree module. Get it merged first, otherwise you just make it harder. And we have a whole lot of examples of when this has happened. Well, we had another one. Um, because this merger did not happen. Instead, work continued to happen outside of the mainline tree. And um, that really killed the project. And in fact, he, Daniel even came around and said, yes, I should have simply followed through with what Andrew said and put it into the main line. The lesson from this, this is a lesson I made in other settings and other places many a time. Tr code that's outside of the mainline kernel tree is invisible to, to a great extent. It doesn't get users, it doesn't get contributors, and it just doesn't have the momentum that code that is in the mainline tree has. When you're outside of the mainline, you're really pushing against the wind. If you've ever watched a bike race, you see how the racers ride in a peloton all together. Because if you're in the middle of a group like this, the momentum of the group and the air that goes with it carries you along. It's really an exhilarating experience to ride in a group of, of bicyclists like that. As soon as you go off out to the side and on your own, you're pushing through the wind by yourself. And it is much harder. It's really the same thing with, with kernel projects. Or really projects, I think, in any large open source project, not just the kernel. If you're not in the main line, then you're not partaking in that momentum. And um, you just have to work a whole lot harder. And as soon as you stop pushing, you fall behind. So that's what happens. So lesson is clear. Go for the main line. If you look at the ButterFS file system, which was under development at pretty much the same time, Chris Mason merged that code very early on, even though it was nowhere near ready for production use. It still isn't. But that project has just continued to thrive since then. It's only accelerated. And that's, that's really the way that you have to do it. Next example is a project that um, did get into the main line back in 2005. This is the M28XX video for Linux driver, a webcam driver. Something that you might not think is all that huge a thing. But this code came in, written by a guy named Marcus Reckberger back in 2005. He was actually working for the manufacturer at that point. So he put it in. It looked like a typical vendor driver. Let's just, um, <laughs> we don't really need to get into that. But um, it was there for a while. Various things happened. If you look through the video for Linux mailing lists um, and you want to find some fairly incendiary stuff, um, look for this guy during this time and you will find it. Okay. Um, we came around to a couple years later and some, and we see the last change that the, the original author made to it. And then less than a year after that, he um, disappeared from the community altogether. And we haven't really seen him since. He was a um, he was a, a capable developer. He was someone we wish he had, but he just he went out of it. And the the key to what went wrong here is a mistake that a lot of people make, especially people who are writing code on behalf of corporations sometimes, who are not used to working with the the community process. In the middle of one of these um, sort of high temperature discussions, he told the video for Linux maintainer that people who are submitting code to you have to be aware of the fact that they will lose control over that code. And the fact is that yes, they will. And that's the point that I'm trying to get at. Let's look at another example. In 2004, Hans Reiser, who had put the Reiser 3 file system into the kernel, saw a patch coming from elsewhere, from Chris Mason actually, to add access control lists and extended attribute capability to the riser FS file system. And he said, no, no, you cannot merge that into my file system. Don't do it. I don't want it. I want that file system to be stable. I want people working on riser 4 instead. I'll come back to riser 4. <laughs> um, so, um, but he lost. 
Okay, all that functionality was merged into the riser FS file system, which extended its lifetime for several years because you need um, access control lists for various security policies. You need extended attributes to work with SE Linux, things like that. So we needed to have it. It went in, and um, he simply lost. The, the lesson is, is pretty clear. This is not true of just the kernel. This is true of any true open source project. Right? If you contribute your code, you've lost control over it, and others will do things to it. If you understand the process and you like it, you think that's really one of the very best things. I love to see code that I put into something kind of take off and fly away and become something that, that I really never would have made it be myself. I think that's the beauty of the system. But if you want to keep it in that cage, um, then don't contribute it because it's just it's not going to work. It doesn't go that way. And you see this also at the maintainer level where people who are maintaining subsystems who think, okay, this is my code. I have control over it, but it's free software. It's not anybody's code. It's not really even Linus's code. And so anytime you run into a situation like this where somebody is trying to stake out territory and say, my code, don't touch, you're going to lose. You don't want to do it that way. And again, that's, that's true of any properly functioning open source project. So different story. Starting back further now, in 2002, if you think back to the, um, the beginning of the 2.5 development kernel series, back when we had that, the, the position of IDE subsystem maintainer was vacant at that time because um, that particular body of code was widely held to drive people insane anytime they tried to work with it. And so we'd had a few people already kind of go and leave. So another guy came along, named Mar was Martin Delecki, and he said, here's a set of cleanups for the IDE subsystem. And they went in, and um, things were okay. Month later, less than a month later, he'd gotten up to version 18 of his cleanup patches, 18 iterations. That also went in, and at that point, he made himself the, the maintainer of the IDE subsystem. It was now his sort of thing. This went on for quite some time, um, until by... Um, in July of that year, he was invited to the Kernel Summit to talk about his work with IDE and so on. In August of that year, August 9th, the 115th IDE cleanup patch went in. One week later, all of that work was torn out of the kernel and thrown away. The IDE subsystem was reverted back to where it was at the beginning of the 2.5 development series, and Martin left. It's like that. It was all gone. So what happened there? Right? Anybody who was actually working with 2.5 in those days quickly learned that if you wanted to run a 2.5 kernel on a system and still have the system, you needed to have SCSI disks. Okay, because Martin had a very interesting approach to how you um, improve a particular body of code. Right? So things tended not to work. You install a system and then you're back to restoring from backups and that's not something that people really like to do, especially if you end up doing it repeatedly. So the lesson, once again, is clear, right? If you have a scorched earth policy towards um, improving a subsystem, you will lose. And this is much, much more true now than it ever was back in the 2.5 days. At this point, if you break something with a patch that goes into the mainline kernel, if you haven't fixed it within about a week, um, chances are very good your code will simply go out of the kernel. We've become very, very intolerant towards regressions. This, the whole process has become faster and, um, one might say, more professional. So you just can't do that. And if people are telling you, hey, this is causing me pain, you need to listen to them because other people will. And um, if you can't respond to that, then uh, things will go wrong. Um, related example, this is a local example. Um, I hope I don't get in too much trouble. Khan Kalivas, by training, um, of course, is not a kernel developer at all. He's a doctor. He's an anesthesiologist. But despite that, he trained himself and became actually a very capable, very talented, um, and very useful developer who did a number of things all over the, the core kernel. Somebody um, who was quite, quite productive. Sometime in 2007, he took a look at the, the scheduler. And he was very interested in desktop interactivity, that sort of stuff. The scheduler that we had was allegedly designed for that purpose, for interactivity and so on. If you looked at the scheduler during those days, I mean, you could go back to an old kernel in the repository and look at the scheduler. What it had, it had become was this incredible mess of heuristics that people added. Okay, well, let's do it this way, boost somebody's interactivity here, something like that. It was very complicated. It was very hard to read, very hard to work on. Nobody really wanted to go near the scheduler anymore at that point, now, with very good reason. It was very hard to change. 
so his idea was, let's take all of that code and we'll just throw it away and we'll start over. And we'll make a very simple scheduler that is based on strict fairness. If you have four processes running contending for the CPU, each process gets 25%, period. We won't worry about interactivity stuff. We won't worry about any of these heuristics. We will simply divide the processor up fairly between the tasks, you know, taking only priorities into account to, um, to shift things when you want to do that. The interesting thing was that he got better interactivity out of this um, after having thrown away all of these heuristics and so on. So he posted this. It grew, drew a whole lot of attention. And in fact, almost right away, Lena said, hmm, yeah, that actually, I like this idea. I like throwing away all that code. I think I could merge this once it's in, in shape for, for merging into the mainline kernel. By two weeks later, um, Linus was singing a very different tune for the simple reason that the scheduler, although it worked better for Khan on his system and for other people as well, worked a whole lot worse for others. And it worked worse for people you know, running large systems. It even worked worse on a lot of desktop sorts of systems. It was creating regressions for other people. Other people were complaining. Khan was not fixing this. And so people started to get increasingly frustrated with, with the approach that he was taking. This kind of reached its, its peak um, in April of that year when Ingo Molnar um, did what has since come to be called ingoing somebody, I've heard this term, where he kind of disappeared for a day and wrote his own version of it and posted it and said, well, how about this version instead? It was based on the same ideas, right, complete fairness. In fact, it was called the completely fair scheduler. But it was a different uh, implementation, which was intended to work better for, for a much wider class of users and not just the particular set of users that Khan was aiming for. So over time, um, that drew attention very quickly. It was CFS that was merged for the 2623 kernel. And shortly after that, Khan left the kernel development community. And he left in a very public and um, very sort of unfortunate sort of way. Things out of here, he can't stand it. Um, gave exit interviews and everything. And um, you know, this was bad publicity, but it was really bad because we lost a really good developer. Right? We lost somebody that we can't afford to lose. We can't afford to lose people like that no matter how strong we are, no matter how well things go. So um, it's this kind of thing that really motivates me to give this kind of talk all over the world for some years now. So what do you learn? How do we avoid creating more cons? Well, if you want to um, change the kernel, one of the first things you learn is that you have to improve the kernel for everybody, not just a specific set of users. And if you don't improve it for everybody, you must at least not make it worse for anybody. Right? You cannot regress the kernel. We have to take it forward and make it better. If you have a patch that makes things better for some people but creates losers over here, you will have trouble. We just don't want to create losers in, in the process now. Um, you know, that is, of course, an ideal. If I said there were never any losers and changes that go into the kernel, I would be, um, be laughable because that's not the real world. But that's really what we shoot for. Okay. Beyond that, there's the simple fact that some parts of the kernel are really hard to change. All right, Khan was aiming at parts of the kernel that are, first of all, in the core, that are important for everybody, but also which tend to be very heavy on heuristic code and things that have been sort of tuned and adjusted over the course of many, many years. And where we have learned that if you make changes that seem to make things better, then you discover you've destroyed somebody else's workload a year from now when they finally get around to testing it. So people are very leery of changes in, in memory management. There's stuff you wanted to do in memory management that never did get merged because it's really hard. It's just plain hard. If you want to play in that particular piece of the kernel playground, you have to have a lot of patience and you have to be prepared to really show over a long period of time that, um, that your code doesn't make things worse for people. Beyond that, communications. Khan tended not to hang out in the Linux kernel mailing list, which is certainly an understandable position to take because um, you have 500 emails in your mailbox every day is painful sometimes. So, um, you know, we can blame Eric Allman, whatever. Um, but, you know, it's hard and it's, you get a lot more work done, or so it seems, if you let that all happen without you, especially since a lot of it seems irrelevant, some of it seems really unfriendly. You may hear things you don't want to hear in various ways. But if you are not part of the discussion, you're not part of the discussion. You're not hearing the things that you need to hear. You're not speaking to the people that you need to speak to. And so you're, you're out of the process. You're not really there anymore. Khan liked to hang out on his own list where he heard 
he had people who really liked his work. Those are the ones who were motivated to subscribe to his particular list. So he was hearing all these people saying, yay, go Khan, you're doing great stuff, we love it. But um, the larger community that was saying, yeah, we like this stuff, but we got a problem here, was not getting through to him. And so um, there was a real disconnect there. That kind of disconnect creates problems for people. We've seen this a lot of times, where you have separate little communities that don't participate in the mainline discussion. And it hurts. You really need to find ways to avoid having that happen to you. And then finally, this is actually one of the key points to this whole episode, is when you're working on any software development project, you need to aim for the solution, not for the merging of any specific body of code. If you look at what happened with the CFS scheduler, Con won. He got what he wanted. He got a completely fair scheduler into the kernel. He got the credit for having driven that idea. Nobody was pushing that till he did it. Everybody knew that was his work, even if it was not his code. But that was not what he wanted. He wanted the code merged. This, this happens a lot. Okay. And it's, it's something that you really want to avoid if you're working with the kernel, because kernel developers will try to merge the best solution that they can find. I mean, developers in any project will, if they're thinking about what they're doing at all. So you need to aim for that. If you see a talk that Dan Fry gives about how IBM works with the open source community, he'll say that one of their internal policies is that if you as a developer push a discussion forward, push a, push a solution forward for the kernel, if you make things better, then you were credited for that internally in your performance reviews, regardless of whether it was your code that was merged or somebody else's. It's a really good policy for a company to have. Um, and you've, I've seen this work with IBM a couple of times where people have have lost out on the, on the inclusion discussion, and they picked themselves up and moved with whatever did get merged because that was where their incentives were, and they were working for the kernel as a whole. So um, if you take nothing else away, take this away. What you're looking for is the solution to the problem, not the merging of a specific piece of code, no matter how nice it is to see your name in the change log. So. <laughs> Um, you know, by, by 2002, it was becoming clear that we needed a next generation file system, even if Hans was a little bit ahead of the rest of us on this. Um, we needed something new, that the EXT, whatever, and so on, were reaching the end of their life. So Hans had all kinds of very interesting, very interesting ideas about how you would do a file system. And he got some funding and he started developing Riser 4 to, to implement some of those, even if Riser 4 wasn't actually his end vision for how systems should work. By um, July of 2003, he'd posted the first version of the code. Um, or actually, um, in 2002, he posted it. By 2003, he was trying to get it merged for the 260 kernel saying, okay, it's ready, let's put it in. Um, there were some very interesting discussions at that point about how, um, how he was solving all of our problems and the code should go in, but it didn't at that point because Linus was not really interested in merging stuff. The feature freeze had already been on for a couple of years and we um, merged way too many features during the feature freeze. Um, and so that one didn't get in. It was the only one, perhaps, that didn't get in. But, um, they didn't get in. But in 2004, he did get it into Andrew Morton's MM tree, which is, was seen as a track for uh, merging into the 2.6 kernel at that point. But it kind of languished there for a long time. He tried to get it into 2.6.14. He tried to get it into 2.6.19. Every now and then, he would come back and say, it's ready. Please merge it. But it didn't go in. And then at the time of his arrest, it still really had no way to go in. And since then, it has pretty much died. Even though there's still people who post a patch to it every now and then, try to make it work on current kernels. But for all practical purposes. This is, a, this is a dead project. So why is that? Um, why did we lose what can really be think of as an innovative body of code from a, a very brilliant and um, talented developer? Well, there are quite a few problems, um, not all of which are even listed here. Riser 4 was not really a POSIX file system, even if it was meant to plug into a POSIX system. It's the only file system I've ever found where you can change your working directory into a plain text file and then read out the, the metadata as little files. You know, you cat creation date and you see when the file was created, things like that. Um, and very much more things. There was a transaction engine and an interpreter built into the file system. Well, some of that stuff got ripped out over time as you tried to get the code merged. It was, it was a very strange thing trying to implement a vision of the operating system future that was not Unix. Right? It was something totally different. And that, that's a problem, especially um, you know, as soon as you start trying to break things or change behavior, 
you run into trouble. Um, lots of technical difficulties. People were finding ways to deadlock the system. There were a lot of um, implementation problems that came about largely due to the fact that the file system was developed really behind a company wall until he was ready to post it. And by then, it was too late to change a lot of fundamental design decisions. And um, that created a lot of trouble. Um, Hans's approach to benchmarks was um, creative. Um, and other people could not get the results that, that he did. In fact, I had a long discussion with him because I posted some results that didn't match his. And um, it turns out that you had to create your files in the file system in a specific order to get the, the kind of results that he was getting. And things like that that tend to make the benchmark less real world than it even was before. That sort of thing. Um, and tied to that was a, a very antagonistic approach to dealing with others. When, when people raised criticism, he would bite back at them. Um, he would accuse people of conspiring to, to keep his work out of the kernel, accuse companies of conspiring to keep his work out of the kernel. Um, it was a very aggressive approach that he took towards people who, who said stuff that he didn't like. And that very quickly made people not want to deal with him anymore. And so it, it cut him out of a lot of the conversation. And finally, people remembered the Riser 3 episode that I mentioned before. Right? And they thought, OK, we're going to merge this file system, but then you're going to move on to Riser 5. You're not going to want to maintain it anymore. We're going to be stuck with it, and we don't like that. So for all these reasons, he, he really had to push uphill to get, try to get this file system merged. And he maybe could have eventually gotten there, but, but he didn't. Right? So lots of lessons. Linux is not a research system. OK, there's a whole lot of innovative code in Linux. People are doing very interesting things. But this is a system that people use to do real work. Right? We're not doing research with it. So if you are um, trying to take it off in very strange directions, you're going to run into resistance. You're gonna, um, it's going to be very hard to do, okay? especially if you're doing things that change behavior visible to user space. If you're really trying to change the way the, the system functions at that level, it's going to be very hard to do. Not impossible, but very hard. No matter how smart you are, and no matter how interesting your vision is, if the implementation is not good enough, it won't go in. Right? If you've got a visionary file system that will deadlock the system, you lose. It's, it's not going to go in. You have to have the technical side there. Um, quite simple. Right? If you see conspiracy theories in what's going on around you, um, you're going to have a hard time. You still see this. I've seen a couple of episodes of this just in the last few months of people saying, you know, this is X company's agenda to keep my code out of the kernel to promote this or to promote that. And while I would not say that this never happens in the kernel development community, I will say that it is very, very rare. The community, if you look at especially the, the upper levels of the community, the people who are in the maintainer roles, these are people who have been working on the kernel for 10, 15 years or so or more. They all fully expect to still be working on the kernel five years from now, but they have no idea who they'll be working for five years from now. Right? So in a real sense, they're working for the kernel um, while trying to keep their employers happy at the same time. There's, there's really not a whole lot of conspiring to promote company agendas at the expense of others in this way. It, it wouldn't fly. Um, it doesn't happen. People are human. Things will happen. But if you think this is going on, you're probably wrong. And finally, the community remembers what has happened in the past. And they think far into the future. And they think, OK, what is going to be the situation five years, 10 years from now? Because we'll be stuck with this code. And if they don't like what they see when they think of that, then again, you'll have trouble. Maintainability is, is a, a key issue in terms of what the code looks like and whether you'll be there to, to stay with it. All right, system tap. Back in 2003, Sun Microsystems came out with, with D-Trace, this fancy dynamic tracing environment. They said, OK, this is great. We've got visibility into the kernel, our kernel that nobody else has. This is why you should all be running Solaris now. And they, they promoted it pretty heavily. That inspired a certain amount of activity within the, the Linux enterprise community, in particular, trying to come up with a credible alternative to this. And so it took a little while, but um, in 2005, uh, RHEL 4 update included a thing called System Tap which was really aimed at solving the same problem. Try to place probes into, a kernel, into the kernel at arbitrary places, into a running production kernel, right? not just the debug kernel. Collect the data out, perform statistics on it, do aggregation, and come up with, with very nice, clear pictures of what's going on inside your system. 
So that was there. Um, it was under development. In fact, it had a very large development team. It had about a dozen developers working on it full time for, for years over this time. But still never quite got into the kernel. Instead, in 2008, we merged a thing called ftrace instead, which was very simple function trace. It would just trace function calls in the kernel. Ftrace has since grown uh, to pick up all kinds of other sorts of tracing functionality. In 2009, we merged perf events, which is another piece of this. This is a um, mechanism for getting events out of the kernel and performing statistics on them, aggregation, all kinds of sort of the sorts of things that you want to do with, with a tool like this. And perf events too has grown amazingly and has developed all kinds of um, new capabilities. Between the two. They're growing into what really looks like the next generation tracing uh, functionality within the, the Linux kernel. Even though in 2009 we saw the 1.0 release of System Tap, just a couple weeks ago we saw the 1.4 release, but I don't really expect to see System Tap in the main line ever at this point, which is too bad. It's a big project worked on by a lot of people who are really trying to do something useful. So, think back to 2008 again at the kernel summit in 2008. When we were talking about tracing, somebody asked the, the, the crowd there, how many of you have tried to use system tap? And about half the people raised their hands saying, yeah, I, I tried to use system tap. How many of you succeeded? And most of those hands came down. About 20% of the people, 20% of the kernel development community had actually succeeded in using system tap. Right? These are not random users. This is the sort of the top level of the kernel development community. If these people can't do it, then um, it's going to be really hard to make work. Yes? <laughs> right. of, of the 20% that succeeded, how many of them were working on the project themselves? And the answer is some of them, but there were other people as well. There, are peop there were people who had actually succeeded in doing that. If you worked at it hard enough, you could do it. Okay. Especially if you just, say, installed a distributor's kernel that was already built to do that. So, you know, this is a bad sign, right? If, you, um, if, if this crowd can't make it work, it's going to be really hard for your average system administrator to, to, um, to get something useful out of it. This was sort of reiterated more recently by Ingo Molnar, who said, in short, that we really shouldn't be focusing on requirements from CIOs or whatever. What we have to focus on is usability for developers and so on. We need to really aim at what they're after and nothing else. So what it comes down to quite simply, is that if the kernel development community doesn't see the value of something, it's not going to go into the kernel. Right? The kernel developers didn't see the value of system tap because it did not work for them. It did not solve their problems, and it was a pain in the butt to try to make work in the first place. So for the, all these reasons, it didn't go in beyond the sort of technical objections that also exist, but which could somehow be worked around if there were motivation to do that. So um, a related example, sort of showing the same thing. My last example. Is, was called at this time Talpa, showed up in 2008. Talpa was a security-oriented subsystem, the idea being to provide hooks for virus scanning sorts of utilities. They wanted to put in a hook so that whenever some process on the system would open a file, the, the Talpa daemon could actually intercept that open operation, go scan the file, look, o look it over really quick, decide if there's anything evil in there or not, and then either allow the operation to proceed or block it forevermore, depending on what it found. So this stuff um, was posted. It did not go in. And there's a couple, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it didn't go in. But one of them was the kernel developers really did not like it. Said, well, why should we bother implementing a really broken security model for, um, to protect systems that are not Linux from, from viruses? Right? Why should we do this? Why should we bother? This is not something that we're interested in. Beyond that, they didn't get their requirements right. The requirements said, basically, we need Talpa. They didn't know what, the, they couldn't say what they were trying to defend against, that sort of thing. They didn't really define their problem very well. And so for all these reasons, they were just told, you know, go away. We don't want this, that sort of thing. But if you look more recently, um, back to last August, um, there's a thing called FA Notify that was merged into 2636. Although I need to put an asterisk on this because there have been some um, system call interface issues that have actually kept it disabled. You can't actually use it yet. But it has been merged. And this is a fun, the main purpose of FA Notify is to provide hooks for virus scanners. Sounds very familiar, all right? And in fact, it's the same code. It was not the same code, but it's a derivative. It's a descendant of that same code done by the same people. So what changed? There are two things that changed in here. 
One was that the notification mechanism was not only cleaned up, but the developer went and took the existing two notification mechanisms that were already in the kernel, unified them, cleaned them up, and created a single notification system that served all three users in the kernel, thus cleaning things up within the main kernel, um, the main VFS layer considerably. People like that kind of stuff, right? Simplify the code, make it work better, that sort of thing. And then they um, rephrased the requirement and, and they said, okay, what we really want to do is to enable these proprietary virus scanning applications, which exist whether we like them or not. We want them to hook into um, file system operations without having to behave like rootkits and patch the system call table, which is what some of these things do. Right? It's really pretty evil, the way some of this stuff works. But that's what they had to do to get the functionality that they wanted. So we provide the uh, way that they can do it officially using a supported interface. And we don't have um, people abusing the system like that anymore. Between those two things, and quite a lot of work, he was able to get this code merged. So sell your code to the developers. Right? Don't try to sell it to. Um, to managers, or even really to customers. You have to convince the developers. This isn't always a good thing. Sometimes it can be hard to convince the development community of stuff that there really is a, a user base for. All right? But that's, that's really I mean, that's the way it works. That's what you have to do. They're the ones who are making these decisions. It's not their managers who are doing it. Okay? Um, and things like user space issues and so on, which is why FA Notify still isn't actually available. Because once, once we put an ABI in the kernel, we can't break it. So there's a whole lot of emphasis on getting that sort of thing right. So we've seen a lot of examples. There's an awful lot more of them out there. I could have filled several slides like this if I'd worked at it. Um, if any of these are particularly interesting, you can ask me in the questions afterward. I should have time for at least one of them. But the point is that there's a lot of them, right? Things go wrong fairly often. It, the potential for trouble is there. So sort of finish out by saying, well, OK, so why bother? This seems really hard. This seems like a pain. Why should we do this? Let's go off and hack on, you know, I don't know, content management systems or something where the standards are a little bit lower. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so why? Just, just a few platitudes here, starting with the fact that it's not as hard as it seems. Okay, all you really have to do is to pay a bit of attention to what you're doing, read some of the stuff that's been written about how the development process works, and listen to what people are telling you. People will try to help you get your code into the kernel. They really will. Even if their help takes the form of, this stuff over here is really crap, throw it away, burn it, and um, so on, they are actually trying to help you. And if you listen to them, you'll get somewhere. Okay, um, it's fun, right? It really is fun once you get going with the system. It's, it's something that you want to do. Um, it's a club that not everybody can join. Um, right? you, you really do have to do a little bit more than looking good in Speedos. But, um, but with some effort, you can get there and be part of something that, that is really pretty cool. Um, if you're looking for work, you can get work that way pretty easily. Um, I don't know how much of a concern that is for people like that. But the key thing really is that this is how our community works, right? This is how you get the kernel to do what you want to do. This is your vote. This is the way that you can drive things in the direction you want to go. If you don't do this, don't complain about where things go, right? This is how you do it. And um, it's really worth doing. So on that note, I'll leave you with um, inspirational words from <laughs> a former vice president of the United States. Um, and uh, it looks like I have a few minutes for questions. So, uh, so I'll bring a the microphone. microphone around. Plenty of hands. Have one, two. Yep, fine. We'll start and work around. Thank you. Uh, just reacting to what you said about Riser 4 and the fact that it's very difficult to get a change in if it changes the visible behavior. And yet, actually, I think we've seen such changes over the history of the kernel. Things like uh, UDEV or MPTL that were well accepted by the developers and users at the time. So isn't it simply a matter of the fact that maybe Hans Reiser was so antagonistic and so sort of unwilling to listen to other remarks, rather than the fact that it, indeed actually his work was changing some of the established semantics at the time? Well, as I said, it was a function of a lot of things. But you have to look at how you change behavior. UDEV did not actually change the way the system worked before. You didn't have to run it. You didn't have to use uEvents. You could still have your slash dev directory with 20,000 device files in it. And um, if you were happy with that, you could do that. 
Okay, if you're running Riser 4, then you kind of buy into what comes with it. And some of what comes with it imposed requirements on the virtual file system layer and so on. So it was a little bit harder. I mean, you know, but that was just one factor of many. As you say, there were quite a few others. I always thought the problem was things like people would complain, I have a working POSIX application that I write on this file system that breaks. And you would say, well, then the application's broken. Yeah. Yeah, if you break applications, you things don't go well. Just wait for the mic, if you would. Uh, John, you've been talking about so many failures, and uh, you've been talking about so many failures. And I'd like to, I'd like you to elaborate on one sort of success story of a patch that's incredibly intrusive and very, very deep level, but really, really apparently works, and people like it. Which is uh, Nick Piggins' work on VFS scalability. Um, what are the things that Nick did right, and what can others learn from him? Okay, um, to, dis to describe those patches would take a while because that's very complicated work that Nick did. But in short, Nick's, Nick Piggins' VFS scalability work has improved the performance of a whole lot of core virtual file system operations on highly parallel, you know, multi-core sorts of environments. You got to a situation where if you have a lot of processes trying to open files at the same time, they were contending with each other for, for various locks in the kernel and so on. If you're running, for example, a big web server, then that may be exactly the workload that you have. So people were running into this. So Nick fixed this, and he um, did it with some very intrusive and very tricky code. But um, the things, you know, he did several things right, starting by being a very good developer and, uh, and doing the code right, listening to um, most requests for changes when things needed to be changed, things like that. But the key thing that Nick did is he didn't change the behavior that you see. If you're a user of the system, all you see is that it goes faster, right? So. Um, in that sense, it wasn't intrusive at all. If you run the VFS scalability stuff, unless it breaks, nothing changes except the, that a bottleneck has gone away. So, um, so that's a relatively easy example. There, there are plenty of others where, where things had to be pushed harder. There was one more over here. Yeah, thanks, mate. So about the scheduler example in CFS, so you said that in, it happens often that um, uh, coders want their code in the kernel rather than solving the problem. And isn't that an indication of the fact that the mechanism used to give credit for ideas is not up to par with the mechanism used to give credit for code? Or you think it's just that programmers, as it's normal, just want their code in? Well, it's both, OK. I mean, certainly it's normal to want your code in the kernel. When, when I put a patch out there, it's because I want it in the kernel, right? Um, but. Certainly, there is more visible credit worldwide to having code in the kernel than to having come up with a useful idea. Okay, I mean, if you look at my own website, I post statistics on the number of patches merged, the number of lines changed. I don't post statistics on useful ideas contributed because I can't count those. So are they noted down anywhere? I mean, are, 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 are those credits noted anywhere? And the answer is that people try to do it in the change logs. OK, so if you look there, sometimes in the code as well, but in particular, the change log is the place to do that. Right, if you look, just the other day, there was a, a patch posted to remove the big kernel lock from the kernel altogether. And he listed a, a list of like 20 people who had done the, the key work in making that particular thing possible, even though it was Arne Bergman who actually put the patch in to do that. So it's there, but that's, that's hard to find. You have to look for it. There's no real way to. It's very hard to create the worldwide fame that you can get just by getting lots and lots of code in the kernel. That, that's just a, a sad fact of life. You know, people in the community perhaps understand where an idea comes from, but beyond that, it's harder. OK, we've got time for one more, if there is any one more. No? Good. OK. Well, in that case, I have the gift, which have you heard the story of? You have, I, so... I think we've um, heard the story, yeah. <laughs> My one that's the tidal wave that washed the the uh, factory away, and they used these to paddle to get back to land, apparently. Oh, the so there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cool. That was a really inspiring talk. I hope everyone will uh, give them the applause. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan.